Hello, hello. Welcome back uh, to Thriving at Junietta. Back again. Season, episode three, season one uh, of our podcast for uh, families and parents of incoming students, really, as we address uh, the transition issues and sort of help explore and insp- explain some of the ways that students can be successful here on campus. I feel like we're giving all the tips away. <laughs> for free. For free. <laughs> it's I included. I this on my own. It's included in the cost of, uh, of this free webinar. Well, uh, yeah. to that end, uh, I would welcome those of you who are new uh, to the webinar uh, and welcome back those of you who are returning. Uh, we're glad to see you among our guest list and, uh, and have you join us. We invite your feedback and your comments. Um, please do uh, send those our way. And if you see my eyes sort of straying to the left, it's because we're uh, we're checking those things out as they come in. But we'll try to answer your questions and engage with your content uh, as best we can. And uh, and it has been uh, an interesting week on campus. The weather's been cold in the morning and hot in I'm the afternoon. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I wake up. I wake up. I check my phone to see what I'm aware for the day. Yeah. What kind? Do I need a sweater? Do I need shorts? Should and I wear black? Should no. That's never a question. <laughs> I always, I always wear black. That's that was an inside because joke. Because that's such a good look. It's just, it's just my thing. It's my color. I wear black. I, I wear I, it very well. I can't, I can't compete with that. And so I try to just wear even stuff mostly. And it works for you. Snazzy is <laughs> always. But I wake up and it's 46 degrees, 47 degrees. It's cold in my room. And then I put on sweats and I look for uh, what it will be the high of the day and the high will be 80. So yeah. how it swings 40 cold degrees throughout the day, I don't know. We would but live it in a place of a wonder. A place of wonder. A natural delight. But it has led a little bit to what we call the Junietta Plague. My roommate is sick right now. <laughs> and I, I think every it. fourth or fifth person I stumble into, I'm sort of encouraging them. I think you need to go see, you know, Nurse Tina in, <laughs> in health and wellness. I think, I think you need to go take a nap. I think you need to get some rest. Mm-hmm. And so there's definitely, I hope, some tender, loving care uh, maybe being sent from home as well in uh, a care package or a phone call or mm-hmm. some sort of a Skype. A, a care package would have... Would have bottle of NyQuil linen or something. <laughs> my, room, my roommate, I woke up today and I was getting ready before he was. He's usually up before me. And so I wake him up. I said, no class for you today? What's going on? He said, no, I'm just dying. I said, you're dying. And then, and then, <laughs> I, looked, and, and then I looked at his dresser. I saw like a, like a whole slew of uh, tissues and paper oh, towel because he was blowing his nose all night. I said, oh yeah, you're going through it right now. So I'm well, we do alone. we do have good resources. I hope you sent him to the health and wellness. Uh, nurse, yeah, I sent him. Nurse like Tina Bratton sure. uh, is on campus really daily, Monday through Friday, from about nine until three. Students can drop in the health service, uh, get some uh, assessments, some supplies, some care, and then uh, even make an appointment to see one of our physicians who are on campus three different days of the week if uh, if things are more serious. Betty's at the front at the front desk, right? Betty McKim. She's a treat and a treasure. She's awesome. She's a hugger like me. Yeah, she, she was a hugger. She gave, <laughs> she gave me a hug while I went to see her. Well, uh, you know, students should be advised to let their faculty members know if they're going to miss class. Faculty, I think, are commonly very understanding. I don't know what your experience with that is, but uh, typically so. if, if – Students drop an email and uh, and let them know and then follow up afterwards with a peer or a classmate or with the professor during office hours to kind of catch up. They can get back on track uh, relatively quickly. So it's a good uh, way to start talking about academics. About, academics, oh, okay. right? Because that's the topic of our webinar today. We have uh, some faculty guests. And I have to say, I'm truly excited by the folks that we've uh, that we've lured into the studio, and by studio I mean my office. Yeah, the behind the scenes <laughs> pre show was was entertainment enough, so it'll probably spill over. We'll so see. Professor Jerry Cruzy is a fellow Illinoisan, someone who yeah, come on into the into the frame, Jerry. Right, uh, right. Jerry Cruzy is uh, is a professor of math and computer science here at Juniata, uh, and uh, just a tremendous colleague. A person who I really came to know as associate provost, 
responsible for some of the academic administration and coordination of faculty efforts and uh, and schedules and budgets and all of the things that I would not excel at. I mean, you were just an organizer of information. Uh, but beyond that, I've come to know through my contact with students that you are just a tremendous faculty member. And when I talk about people who have presence in the classroom or people who can share information that may be inaccessible or unapproachable, your name always comes up. I, and I think I've told you that. I think you know that. But uh, it's I'm worth good. affirming. Good too, yeah, <laughs> Just to attest to that, uh, Dr. Gilbert sent me to see Dr. Cruzy because um, I didn't have any advisors. And after I saw you to be my general advisor, I went to see him to be my POE advisor. Um, and because he's a math department and I'm a physics department, he could only be my temporary advisor. And mm -hmm. I needed a different um, faculty member to be my POE advisor, which turned out to be Dr. White. But I held like about a 15, 20 minute conversation with him just basically in passing because I was discussing uh, my situation and why I came to him. And he just made me feel at home in his office. I just met the man, never saw him a day in my life. And it was a, it was a great conversation. I felt better. There you go. Well, wow. I had nothing really to feel bad about, and somehow I still felt better. So thank you. So <laughs> I just have to share the. I'm in a couple of fantasy, like a fantasy baseball and fantasy football league, and my team name that I've chosen is Prepare to Be Underwhelmed. So after that, <laughs> after that introduction, I feel like saying Prepare to Be Underwhelmed. But to Devin's wow. point, I think. So thank you. It's great. Wow. It's fun to hear like these great things about me. And I'm sitting right here. It's like, great. Um, but I would even venture a guess that most of our faculty love those interactions and love meeting with students and trying to help out as much as they can. And I know one of the things that is a theme that we talk about a lot is trying to help our students understand that it's okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm or stop by and talk to we love we love that interaction with students and uh i mean it keeps us young and uh it, it is just a way for us to feel like beyond the classroom that we're making a difference now can i go on can i say something about that like this is going to feel yeah like, of course it's going to feel very administratively um but maybe in some of your previous podcasts you probably maybe have talked about the term high impact practice uh, a little bit a, a little, little bit. bit so it's one of those things um where they looked when they looked at students who were in college and who by whatever metric you want to define success if you call these students successful mm -hmm. and they said okay what these students who we think were successful what are some of the things they did in college and they found like 10 or 11 things that were pretty common among these students who were successful the and, richly engaged educational experience uh, yeah yeah and and high impact practices yep. and one of those is interacting with a professor and instructor outside of class there's just that little and not saying that you do it every day all the time but students who had that experience some kind of some kind of chance to interact with a professor just outside of the classroom really made a difference in a lot of those students' um, career. So I think that we love that. And I think most of the faculty here at Juniata really buy into that. As well. It's so important. It's so important. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, I'm teaching first year foundations and our second guest is here going to talk about first year foundations and the curriculum that we've developed for first year students. But, you know, this is really kind of a transitions class and how we help students understand their role and responsibility and, and some of what they might accomplish, some of what the supports and resources are for them. But in this class, we were talking about our faculty and office hours right and you're kind of oh, inviting yeah. a little conversation about that the, the yeah. importance of students visiting faculty during office hours do you take advantage of office hours um, I plan to be making a trip to Dr. Bukowski uh, <laughs> tomorrow because I have a full calculus 2 exam on Friday so that'll be fun but he's he's a I enjoy his class I like his teaching so I, it's not going to be so what do you, what, what draws you into office hours? Is it just a prep for tests or are um, you, what, what, what are you going to see faculty about? For me personally, I use my trips to office hours is usually dealing with the math department because I feel like I need the 
I need the reaffirmation of certain concept, concept, wow. concepts mm-hmm. um, because I need the extra practice. And just to make sure I'm on the same page with my professor, how they want it done and how um, I should change anything. Um, otherwise, you know, it's for tests and not really in other departments do I really go. That's yeah. just that's just me personally. I think one of the things too, I went to a big state uh, institution for my undergrad and I loved it. But I think the thing that really jumps out to me still after 20 years here at Juniata is that we even have those posted office hours. But when I'm here, my door's open. Mm -hmm. If somebody stops by and it's not an office hour, I'm still going to talk to them and say hi. And and I think once again, I would say most of the faculty here at Juniata have that kind of mentality that we frame things that way a lot. So and it's um, remarkable. I, I mean, I tell my students. Sure, stop and ask about a question maybe that emerged in the lecture or review a test and, you know, maybe get some guidance around that. Maybe, you know, test your knowledge against what you think the faculty member um, might reflect on with you. I said, but if you don't even know what to say, ask them how they got interested in the discipline, (laughs) right? Ask them what their research is. Ask them... What, oh, you, what you might do to sort of further your knowledge. I, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be bounded by the specific class or course. And, mm-hmm. you know, at, at the end of the day, you're going to be applying for grad school, right? Oh. And you're going to need a letter <laughs> from, you know, Professor Kuzi or Professor Bukowski or someone who can say, you know what, I know that student, not just as a person yeah. sitting in a chair in the classroom, but I know their potential and I know their curiosity and I know their energy and enthusiasm for this work. And that comes in a one-on-one personal relationship. And for students, it can be really intimidating, but I think you're absolutely right, Jerry, that faculty want that to happen. They want mm-hmm. students in their space, uh, especially here. It's so great um, when I'm able to write a letter of recommendation, not you know, grad school or maybe provide some kind of information for a potential employer for my students. And when you have something personal, some kind of connection with the student that you're able to share, to me, my perception is that that always goes so much farther, Mm -hmm. that you're indicating to them that, hey, this student has been engaged and has been doing things. And I should throw, everybody was throwing a lot of love my way when I came in. I mean, right back at you two guys, (laughs) like, oh. I mean, working with Matthew has been wonderful, and I'm sorry it's taken me five or ten minutes to acknowledge that. <laughs> and just, you know, I was like, you know, you know, okay, I'm a nerd. I'm a math and computer science professor, so I'm going to out myself as a nerd, but I don't think anybody's going to be surprised. And so the thing I would say after you left, I was like, hmm, the force is strong in this one. <laughs> right. It just has that feeling. It's too true. That, it's you know, too I'm true. just like, where's the lightsaber? I know it's around here somewhere, and he's going to go off and do good. I so. have one in my room at home. No way. Don't, don't tell anyone. No don't way. Anyone. It's probably red. It's probably red. <laughs> it's blue. Oh, oh, that's my favorite color. Uh, well, oh, not to man. go too far down the Star Wars uh, path. <laughs> you know, it, it, we're in week four or five, if you count the first two days of yeah. the week, that doesn't really count. And so, yeah. you know, we've heard students took a bio test a little over a week ago, chemistry yeah. test last yeah. week. Some of those grades are starting to come back. Yeah. And every student that took a test isn't getting. I got a 95 on my calculus. Oh, nice. Course. Some are. Okay, that's nice great. Nice <laughs> and that's great. But some people are getting yeah. that first college B or C yeah. or D. As a faculty member, what, you know, can you talk a little bit about that, that moment when a student gets a grade that doesn't align with where they think they might Something. be or that's really kind of a wake up call? And that's, I mean, Absolutely. And it's this time, you know, th- there's a lot of research and I try to make sure that my students early on get some feedback, some some graded feedback from me. You know, even if the test doesn't happen until week three or four, I think it's important for students to get some feedback. And sometimes, you know, that feedback is a little different than what they would expect. And that's when we talk about these conversations. I think they're so helpful for students. You know, number one, to sit down and realize you know, look, let's just take a look at the syllabus. This is a portion of your grade. It doesn't define who you are. And if things didn't turn out, it's an opportunity to learn and understand, okay, well, maybe what are some of the things that I could do 
that I could change in my routine that might help me mm-hmm. do better. So beyond, we, you know, we've talked about office hours and, and meeting with the professor, but is there something else I can do? And I use an analogy with my students. Um, I like to go on a jog. I don't run very far. I don't run very fast. But it's just great for me to feel like I can get out and and do some work. And I tell my students, if I just have kind of an idea, you know, sometime tomorrow I'm going to go on a jog, Mm. there's a pretty good possibility I'm not actually going to go jogging. Mm. But if I plan out and say, you know what, as soon as I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to wake up a little early, I'm going to go out and run, and then I have the rest of the day, or I'll come home at lunch, walk the dogs, go on a jog. If I have planned out and have a definite time when I'm going that I'm going to devote to my class, or in my case, doing doing a, a run, I feel like it's much more likely that that happens. Mm-hmm. So, and I think, yeah, to it's an opportunity for procrastination. Yeah. And a lot of students will come through and say, you know, I was really able to get by in high school without that complete effort. And they might not have all the strategies down that might work for them. So obviously planning a time to devote to class is something we talk about. And then maybe something else. And I know we do a lot of pedagogy. I'm sitting with the, he's off camera right now, but the king of problem-based learning. So I'm going to tell him to cover earmuffs, Dan, don't listen. But, you know, I still, there are, are times when I might lecture or have, you know, convey some, some information and, when students are taking notes, the the statistics about how students perform and understand the material if they just take notes mm-hmm. is uh, you know it's pretty dramatic. So there are a lot of little things and opportunities. I think if if students are not quite where they want to be, then I think there there's an opportunity for them to to learn and, and grow and and maybe change their strategies a little bit. What are so in in a couple of weeks we're going to have you know, our friends from Quest. And Quest is our academic success center. It is the place where all of that happens, but it's also well connected to faculty efforts to support learning and encourage students in this way. But, you know, what are, what are, for students who maybe need some extra assistance? Yeah. Are there department-based initiatives? Are there tutoring opportunities? Yes. What, yes. What, where would they go for some help? Yes to all. So, you know, one of the, so if a student is struggling, one of the things they want to do, obviously, is to check with their professor and, and have an interaction there. But institutionally, we also have some, uh, you know, through Quest and some of the, um, you know, there's some tutoring. We have a lot of group tutoring. Um, a lot of the math courses, actually, they're, there are opportunities for students to get individual tutors, mm-hmm. but there are also opportunities where for we just have three nights a week, Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. We have drop-in sessions from 7 to 9, and any student in any math class is welcome to stop by, and there'll be some tutors there to help them with, uh, with their work. And it could be one of those things where it's just other people doing work, and somebody is there. And it's amazing, you know, you'll, you'll just be by somebody and they're able to do the problem. Mm -hmm. Not that you're actively helping, but when somebody perceives that somebody's there who could help them out, they feel a little more empowered to get through the problem. So, and actually there's a a significant (laughs) body of research that's, that fundamentally says group tutoring is more effective than individual tutoring. Absolutely. Although and students prefer or say that they prefer individual individual tutors. tutoring, but group tutoring <laughs> and learning from your peers is another, um, you know, they've done the scholarship of teaching and learning and they've had some, you know, amazing, uh, well-received professors who've won teaching awards, but when they tried to parse out, what were the academic gains that students made? They actually made more gains if they were learning from a peer. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of opportunities institutionally for students to do that. So talking to your instructor, but then also taking advantage of some of that. It also, you know, if if a student was to say, I'm gonna commit to two of those three labs, that's four hours that they're studying (laughs) math. And that in itself structurally can be profound if if they're not used to setting aside that time. Yeah. Um, you know, the other kind of observation that I make sometimes is that for students who this is their first B or C or D, the instinct oh. isn't to 
open up and lean in, <laughs> right? It's yeah. just sort of, oh, I don't want anyone to even see me. Yeah. And so, you know, how do you advise a peer maybe to acknowledge their vulnerability in a place where it may seem like everyone else is doing great and oh. they're the dummy? I think it's realizing that everyone goes through it. Like, you're, re- you're yeah. not the only person. Uh, it's, it's not like it's brand new for a person to get a B or a C. Uh, I personally, um, the first time that I I went from flying high in my grades to yeah. just getting hit with something like that was in uh, fifth grade, no, sixth grade with Mrs. Jacobs in, in math. And she always, she was kind of like a mom to me. She always said that I made stupid mistakes. And she, she just talked to me like teachers don't usually talk to their <laughs> students right. because she knew my father. So yeah. um, she talked to me that certain way. And, you know, she was just like, breathing down my neck whenever because she could see it in my work I would forget a number or forget a digit and I would just try and rush through things because I thought I knew it all Mm. and I would it would affect my grade and that was the first time where I realized that I need to take my time with certain things Mm -hmm. um if there's things that I'm not understanding it's okay to talk to someone or if I if I think that I know it and I'll just I'll get it eventually because it always comes to me eventually it may not come you, you're not really in a position to, to take that risk and, and um, not nip it in the bud when, when it happens. So it's not something to say that you're less than. It's not something to say that um, it's all going to go downhill from here. It's just an opportunity to realize what you've done wrong and then just try and, and fix it to the best of your ability because you have resources to do so. It's not anything to say about the person because everyone literally everyone has gone through it i don't mm-hmm. um so it's, it's kind of like like sometimes people get depressed on facebook mm-hmm. because people curate their their lives to the outside world and they're showing all these fun things they're doing and in some ways I, like i don't think the atmosphere at Juniata is competitive my big state school the grades were basically on a curve and right. it didn't really matter what your score was. It only mattered what your score was in relation to other like, students. I'll cut you in the bathroom to get ahead. Right. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. happen here. Yeah. yeah. And so I don't think <laughs> that happens here, but I think it's hard because no, like, if you're in a social media and people are curating all their best lives, like you think, Oh my God, I'm the only one. And that's not the case. We've all struggled. We all have things where we hit the wall and thought, Oh my gosh, you know, what am I, what am I doing? <clears throat> the, like the world is going to end or something. Yeah, and, and it's not. So it's easy for me to say now, but you do get through it. You do learn from that, that you can go ahead and, and sometimes hitting that challenge. I had, you know, one of my most difficult courses in grad school. The instructor said, you remember the hard things. If you have something that's easy and you're just able to blow through it, you really don't engage with it. Once again, Dan, close your ears. Dan uh, is our problem-based learning person, which is all about the struggle. Look at that (laughs) academic attribution. No plagiarism here. Oh, oh, man. Oh, gosh. You know, (laughs) it's it's part of my DNA now. And and so, you know, you have that opportunity, and it's okay. Like I said, it's easy for me to say. But the struggle sometimes and getting through that struggle is something when you look back and say, wow. It's easier too the second time, and and, and professors time. appreciate like if you get a, a bad grade or just even an average grade and you seem to be struggling and your professor sees that you're struggling. In my experience, they always appreciate when you take that initiative to see because yeah. they see your grade first, obviously. So they see that you need help with that, and they're hoping that you make an improvement with that. Yeah, and uh, like when you go to them. For, for help with that, they usually appreciate that. In my experience, they always appreciate a student actually wanting to better themselves and their education and trying to fix what they've done. And, and I think too, so definitely we've stressed a lot about office hours and some of the official things, but finding uh, a cohort in your class maybe is something unofficial. And sometimes that is really great too. And it also makes you feel a little more connected to the rest of the Juniata community, is finding somebody to study with or... Well, it's, it's interesting about. because that begs a different piece of research mm-hmm. on right-minded peers oh, and yeah. sort of this idea that, you know, in your friend group, you don't want to be the best at the thing that your friends are good at because uh, you, your skill level will help pull everyone else up. 
Actually, you want to surround yourself with people who are just a little bit better at things than you are, those right-minded peers, so that they actually pull you up to their level. And, and in the research, it's interesting, students can surround themselves by right-minded peers, but every student is also a right-minded peer for some Somebody other students. Else, right. So there aren't less than or more than students, but, but being purposeful or thoughtful about, hey, that person seems to get it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to approach them to study rather than that person seems to like the same music as me. <laughs> I'm going to approach that person to right. study. Um, right. I, I think some intentionality there can be really valuable for students. That's a great point. That's a great point. Well, math sometimes is set aside writing. Oh, as if yeah. the two never oh, should meet. Yeah. And we know that here students have to have oh. some level of ability or affinity in both, but certainly in writing. Yeah. Writing is hard. It is super hard. <laughs> and I, I I, don't know, maybe Davion, I don't know if you, you do it, but I, if I reflect back on my undergraduate experience, I was in, a, you know, like an engineering computer science program. And we were all about the content and creating some wonderful solution, maybe a program, maybe a circuit, mm. something like that. And I tell people I didn't learn how to communicate until, I mean, really at a, at a, at a good level. I don't feel like I was a good communicator until I had my first job because it did me no good. Like if I wrote a program, if I couldn't explain to anybody else what I did, it didn't do any good. Or if somebody came to me with a problem, if I couldn't communicate with them to really understand what they needed, I might go and create a program that does nothing of what they need. And so I think part of it with anything, it's the reps. Like the more you write, mm -hmm. the more you practice email or whatever, even you get better. And then I think other people too, sometimes you maybe have heard the term, we write to think. Like if I have a really hard concept and I want to communicate it to somebody or I really am trying to understand it, if I sit down and try to write something about it or try to write it from an expository point of view, try to explain it to somebody, it helps me kind of crystallize what my thoughts are. And so, yeah, you think like, oh boy, if you're in a technical field, you don't ever really have to write or do anything. And it's like, it's not the case. And being a good writer, I think really helps you communicate and do well in whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any easy answer, but for me, the thing was just having repetition and, and keeping practice and, you know, write something and then reread it and say, does that make sense? And have somebody else read it. Have somebody else read it. Get I'm some very, feedback. If it's super important, I very rarely just hit send. I'll type something, look it over, maybe ask a friend to look it over. Now, from an academic integrity standpoint, you want to make sure that you understand the guidelines, like if you're doing individual work. It's your work. Yeah, yeah. So you want to make sure that when you're asking for help that you're following the guidelines that the course or the assignment is. is but the Writing there. Center and the Beagley Library yes. is a yeah. great resource uh, yeah. for students, peer tutors who can give you know peers feedback. I think the challenge sometimes is that students will wait. If I'm nervous about writing, yeah. I wait until too late to do that first draft to get yeah. it to the to the writing center to then be able to revise. And so some of it is... And, and it's like a ladder. I, Carol Peters, who uh, I'm stealing this from her, you know, she says, we will, if you come in, like we can, we can help you get a C paper to a B level. You know, it's not going to be, oh, you'll spend some time with the writing center. You automatically go to a perfect paper. It's an iterative process. So they can help. You can do some more, do some more revisions, come back. And I think this time pressure is a big thing. Give, if you give yourself time, mm -hmm. that's one of those strategies. Just give yourself enough time so you can try something and then come back and revisit it again. I think it's, it's something that's nice. Nothing easy. You know, I don't have the Harry Potter magic wand that mm -hmm. I can stop time. But um, if you are able to find that extra time and start early, I think that's great. And I would say some of the, you know, syllabi structure it. So that you have drafts, you have iteration that yes. gets built in yeah. into those assignments in a way that's purposeful and powerful, mm -hmm. and hopefully groom students into into some of those good academic practices. Yeah. I um I know I I was always sort of 
late to the game with one of my favorite professors. I, I would panic, I'd procrastinate, <laughs> and then I would end up, you know, calling, trying to get an extension. And uh, I had done this a number of times. She was my advisor, just truly amazing, <laughs> amazing person. But I would always call very early in the morning, you know, about my hard drive crashed or, you know, I, I lost my paper. And so I, I remember calling, it was like five or six in the morning. I remember calling to leave a voicemail at that time uh, on her office voicemail. And to my surprise, she picked up the phone and she said, Matthew, I've been waiting for your call. Oh. <laughs> he I knows was all busted. the tricks. I was busted. Oh man! But that was sort of the moment that when I kind of broke out of that and uh, oh, yeah. and, and it started to change my ways. And what a great, like, <laughs> what a great interaction too. It wasn't yeah. just what do you do? It, you know? Yeah. What a it was lighthearted, but it also seemed to get the point across. So thank you, Doctor Hodgson. That's awesome. Yeah. That was, that's a great story. Heart. Yeah. Well, Jerry, it has been such a delight to have Thank you here. You. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for your work in the classroom and outside of it with advising, uh, with administration. Uh, it's just a blessing to have colleagues like you. And, uh, right and back at We're going to have you back at some point. That'd be wonderful. I, I would love it. Anything. And, and just in general, anybody, I always enjoy meeting new people. Uh, and uh, anything I can do to help, I'm always uh, happy to do that. So it's homecoming family weekend this weekend, and I know you're always around. So maybe people will see you. That around. would be great. Um, you're there's... gonna be gone, right? No, no, oh, I'm gonna okay. be here, and I, well, it's one go. of my favorite uh, weekends uh, of the year to get a chance to meet some of our students and their families, and uh, yeah, uh, it'll be great. So there's the shot. Yeah. yeah. All right. Awesome. Now, are we gonna do the the talk show thing? Like, yeah, you're gonna I... kind of shuffle off. Am I gonna, gonna shuffle gonna... off that way? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, thank you guys. It was great to meet and uh, the capable hands of one Dan Drees. Uh, that's right. That's right. Doing. We'll invite Professor yeah. Drees over. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye. All right. Good thanks, luck, Jerry. All right. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. I've been taking copious notes oh, on, uh, well, yeah, on all the I, slams. I stole all his uh, all his problem based learning <laughs> right? stuff. So <laughs> for the reflection go. that's due yeah. later. Right? Yeah. That's, <laughs> right. that's right. That's right. All right. <laughs> Take care, Jerry. See you. Yep. Well, we are glad to, uh, to welcome you as our second guest. Thank you for Professor the Professor Dan Dries, one of our uh, chemistry faculty members and an honoree for teaching excellence. Uh, you were one of the first sort of lecturers. When our faculty are uh, recognized for teaching excellence, they are invited to sort of share kind of wisdom, philosophy, perspective on practices of learning and engagement and kind of the rich tradition that is the liberal arts. And so. Uh, I got to sit and hear some of your reflections, and it was profound and revealing, and uh, and uh, truly a blessing. Well, thank you, man. Yeah, I appreciate. I, that was the most terrified I have been in a long, <laughs> long <laughs> right? Time. Because you're in front of all the people that yeah. sort of are in your world. That's at right. The moment. I mean, I've gone to scientific conferences and I've spoken to a room of a thousand people. You know, first day in class, that's nerve wracking. Wedding speech, that's nerve wracking. It's totally different. When you're standing in front of people like Jerry, who's a fantastic person, right? right? right. People like yourself, right? Students who are just wise and, and they're waiting to kind of like hear this this great speech. And let me tell you, it is terrifying. It's a lot of pressure. The whole time, it's am I living up to expectations, right? So, you know, it doesn't well, matter. Well, you how did. Many you did. Oh, thanks, man. Thank <laughs> I you think it's much. probably. Online, you could probably seek it out. It is, in the, uh, including a gaffe in the in middle. The I totally had a Freudian slip that uh, <laughs> called out my colleagues. Uh, it was embarrassing, uh, but it was it was fun. Well, I we invited you because uh, you know, for students in the class of 2023 and who are onboarding this fall, they're experiencing a few different elements of the curriculum than students before them. Parents, check out the the. Parents Facebook. Yes. Class of 2023. And, well, there's a class of 2023 Facebook group. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I think, you know, um, Jana is the person who kind of is coordinating that. And I think I pushed through uh, that comment. But Jana, if you put a link through, I'll push the link through as well. Um, but the class of 2023 is coming in with a different sort of first year curriculum. They are. And you have been profound uh, as one of our faculty members in helping to design the curriculum and think about the essential elements 
that kind of will help students transition to the academic environment, to Juniata, to their successful experience. Well, thank you. Uh, my job has been to find the uh, craftiest cats I can and just herd them <laughs> for a week in the summer and harness all this energy and, and get some really fun stuff out to, um, to do with our, our incoming students. So it's been a real delight. I mean, I've gotten to know other people on campus that I really didn't know that well. Um, I've gotten, we have um, student facilitators who help out in that class and I've gotten to know a whole new set of students that I don't usually have an opportunity to interact with, whole wide swath of stories. Um, yeah, it's been a wonderful experience. So there's three basic elements of the, you know, the first year curriculum and students are engaged in two of them now with one of them to be added in the spring semester. You talk about those three classes and how they live together. Yeah, sure. So um, the in the fall of your, your first semester on campus, you take a, a course called comp first year composition. Uh, and, you know, when I go through this list of the topics in first year composition, I think I'm going to audit that, and I'm going <laughs> right? to audit that, and I'm going to audit that. So writing is at the core. But the faculty who are teaching it get to select kind of the content, the That's materials, right. the, course, right. the course materials and questions. Yeah, just some fantastic classes. One of my favorites is you don't need this class. <laughs> I am so intrigued I saw about that. I saw that. talk about yeah uh, some sort of switch, right? So and um, it's a little ironic because actually you do need. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's absolutely true. I haven't advised you who's in that class. That's funny. Uh, and so, yeah, so you take um, two of your core courses is, are um, a first year composition class, and you can select, you can prioritize which classes you most want. And then, through the magic of somebody in the math department, um, Professor Kaminga, uh, she's written an algorithm, which, by the way, she wrote with students. There were students who were paid to help come up with the algorithm, and it was a great um, kind of experiment for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you get to your 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 choices get ranked, and this magical algorithm tries to match every student up with something on their top five, and hopefully in their top three and top two. That's great. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I've heard wonderful things about the composition classes. You know, everybody's got a different story to tell, and yet there are still some kind of common elements. I have stories. two. I've actually, and, and I said with Professor Cruzy, you were here, obviously, but, uh, you know, writing is hard, and it's intimidating, and students have to take risks with it. And I think the faculty who teach those classes understand that the difference between high school writing, which is, a five paragraph essay generally at best <laughs> is not the same as college writing where students will have elements of technical writing they will have creative writing they will have you know kind of communicative writing they will have academic writing there's different sorts of forms that they need to begin to master and determine you know the differences of and, and how to give voice to those things and yeah these classes begin i think to invite some of that conversation yeah, I, I teach our senior um, writing seminar in our senior thesis class in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And, you know, there are students who have not had to write a lengthy paper for quite some time, and then they come into that class, and we talk about writing for a scientific audience and write the different kind of style that you need. And I tell them, if you can't write clearly and coherently, so if I am reading junk, then it whittles away my confidence in your ability to do science. If you're not careful about the language you choose, how can I be sure and confident that you're being careful in the way you design your experiment, the way you analyze your data and things like that? So, um, yeah, it, it's it's really important. Uh, and I, I write far more than, than I thought I would <laughs> uh, nowadays. I mean, between grants and manuscripts uh, and things for the, for the college. Um, I don't know, Damian, do you, do you do a lot of writing in the physics department? Um, <clears throat> We're thinking as, maybe if you go to graduate school or something, you'll, you'll be doing some work. I mean, I personally still take a lot of English and philosophy electives because I've always, and even though I'm a STEM person, I always enjoyed reading and reading and writing. That's awesome. So, so um, like, I don't have that that stereotype STEM person issues with uh, not being able to communicate and write and, mm -hmm. and give a speech. Um, it's, it usually it comes easier to me than it is for a lot of my peers mm -hmm. because in physics. Um, we did have to type up our lab and we had to, you know, explain everything in addition to the lab notebook. And so um, 
yeah, there was writing to be done. And it looked like it was a little harder for some people because they didn't have the practice. But I think um, your coursework is a great example. I know I tried to, to read um, scientific nonfiction and then also kind of historical fiction and some fiction pieces. And I think the more that I read, the more I hear other people's voices, mm -hmm. the more I can kind of pick that as it serves its purpose, right? There are some papers, scientific papers, where I need a strict analytical mind. There are others that are more of a review and kind of thinking outside the box and coming up with ideas mm. and hypotheses about where could this stuff go, mm -hmm. right? And some, mm -hmm. of, some of that um, creative writing, you know, I, I kind of can use that in that aspect too. So I think, you know, choosing coursework that, that you know, challenges you in the way, the different types of reading that you're going to do, the different types of reading, uh, writing that you're going to do, I think it's really fantastic. And ultimately, you know, the kinds of careers and experiences that we're preparing students for after Juniata are not, you know, sort of writing a really nice recursive loop in a program, right? right. Anyone can do that who has C++ coding experience <laughs> or, you know, uh, you know, making the silicone gel in the, with a pipette or whatever in chemistry. You know, I can work in a lab. But we, we want to prepare students who are going to manage the lab, right, or determine what the project is or do the research or, you know, take that leadership level in, in their work and life. And to that end, you've got to be able to communicate. You've got to be able to write. Right. You've got yeah. to be effective. Yeah, we redid our um, sophomore, junior level bioanalytical chemistry class. And it's, it's bioanalytical. And so it's supposed to be really numbers heavy, data driven, really experimental. Um, but Professor Williams and I, who both are all about um, kind of inquiry-based labs, so we kind of blew that lab up and made students, asked students to generate their own types of questions. And part of that lab is um, they work in teams and then they have to communicate to another team. And then that second team picks up where that first team left off and goes with it. And so in doing that, we tried to make it really clear that you need to be able to communicate that to somebody who has not done that experiment yes. before so that they can pick that up and either verify it or do something new to it. Uh, and they find out quickly, right? I think we scientists um, have a tendency to think we need to speak in heavy jargon, really complicated sentences, mm -hmm. and show just how sophisticated our discipline is. Mm -hmm. And when students end up doing that, they lose their audience 99 times out of right. 100. And so that exercise is a great way of really kind of making sure that they, that they can communicate well and succinctly and clearly. Yeah. Well, uh, second element is foundation. Yeah. And we are both in the classroom for foundations, which is a joy. Um, and, uh, and so what is the purpose of foundations? How does that fit in? Yeah. So foundations, um, you know, we recognize that um, students are so much more than just that time that they spend in the classroom, right? It, we have this false perception that if they just show up into the classroom and listen to what we have to say, then, then we'll do just fine. And yet there are all kinds of other factors that go in, including the transition, say, from high school to college, from urban to rural, right, away from home, away from that peer group into a new peer group mm -hmm. and all that stuff that comes along with it. And some people handle that transition really well and some people struggle a little bit. Right. And they, they'll find it out later. Uh, and so we want to make sure that everybody comes in with the opportunity to, to start on a little more of an equal footing to make sure that we're not kind of tugging at two different places and some succeed because they had an easier transition, which has nothing to do or very little to do with academic proficiency, right. what class they're taking. Ability. It has a lot more to do with right what their experience was, what they're bringing into the classroom, what their home life is, what their roommate situation is, all these kinds of things, right? Yeah, it's those external pressures yeah. and you know the student's ability to kind of multiply manage. <laughs> oh my goodness, all of those yeah. Demands. You know, I, I, I have this conversation frequently with my advisees, uh, and that is, you know, when you were in high school, you know, you had independence, but you had a very structured day, right? Mm -hmm. You knew when classes started, you knew when it ended. If you had something extracurricular, co-curricular, you knew when that started, if it's a sports schedule, music schedule, theater schedule, whatever. Um, here, you get a lot of free time, and you can fill that time in productive ways and non-productive right. ways. Uh, and so finding that discipline uh, and, and so we try to give students tools. In fact, this week coming up, um, we're going to be talking about an assessment to ask what are your study habits mm -hmm. and kind of to check in. 
Uh, and then also to think about how we spend our time and how we might better structure our time. And if you go to like education psychology, they tell you cramming is bad, right? right. It's much better to take an hour, do this today, come and revisit the next day, take two days off, come and revisit. And so we're going to kind of explore how we study, how we interact with our material, uh, and what's the most effective way of kind of retaining that moving forward. And so the content, and I've been able to sort of watch and witness the development of this, has been really purposeful. The class started really thinking about relationships and networks and supports that students might encounter or struggle with on campus, who are important people that can help them solve problems or provide support. And now we're kind of moving into thinking about, you know, the student as a learner and what they've experienced and what they need to know and how they kind of begin to gain capacity that's going to make them successful as we push through the last two thirds of, uh, right. of the semester. Yeah, you know, so many of us have these meaningful conversations one on one with students as they have agency to come into our office and have those office hours, right? Those those interactions. And sometimes that happens the first semester. Sometimes it happens the eighth semester or mm -hmm. seventh semester. Uh, and we have all this collective wisdom on campus. And so this is a great opportunity to kind of harvest that, harness that, and find the tools. There are tools that I like and other things that I just don't have a good tool with. And in this process, I found fantastic resources for students that I've been able to push out to advisees that I, I frankly didn't necessarily know of, or it was a or it was cast in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I think um, this is a great opportunity, um, frankly, for us faculty and staff to better know the challenges that the students are going through. Yeah. So we have, um, in this class, we encourage reflective writing so that students can kind of start um, finding their own voice in these um, pieces. Uh, and. I mean, it's what the fourth full week and I've learned so much more about what, so I teach a transfer section of foundations and, you know, I've had advisees and students who are transfer students, um, but it's a totally different window when you ask them to it reflect really on things that are outside of what I usually do for advising the classroom. Mm -hmm. So you guys, you guys really read those? Yeah, believe it or not. <laughs> so, like, so my, I love my, that. My, I math, love my math professors for the last two semesters, they had us fill out like the how you learn uh -huh. the, um, sheet or yeah. whatever. And, you know, I honestly filled it out. I wrote how I personally, um, you know, taking information and what learning styles are learning for me. I didn't know that they actually care. I thought it was just like some of the department said that you had to do. Yeah, I mean, it is really valuable. Yeah. And, and um, you know, for students to engage in that self-learning and reflection, but also to sort of give voice to some of the anxiety or some of the stress or to, you know, just release some of that uh, to the universe can be helpful. As a, as a teacher, it also gives me a chance to check in with a student who maybe doesn't have another outlet to experience or express, you know, that, that sort of level of panic or. Yeah. What I found this past week, I don't know if you have also Matthew is that, um, you know, this is when the biology exam hits the chemistry, the calculus, whatever, right. Uh, first paper comes up, those kinds of things. Cool. And this is the first time where, um, some students have fallen off the radar in terms of writing these reflections. Mm -hmm. And so it gives me an opportunity to reach out and say, Hey, you know, you are uncharacteristically absent from class today, or you usually turn in really thoughtful responses and I haven't seen one from you this week. Is everything okay? And so I've had two instances where I've picked up on folks who are just having a hard time juggling things. Yeah. And you know, one of that, one of the hard things of that transition is admitting you need help, right? And kind of saying, I just can't do this on my own. We're so used to saying, I, ha I did this just fine in high school. Right. I, I can I can get this together if I just do this or do that. Uh, and sometimes it's a, just a different approach. And so I've already had some conversations with some students and getting them the resources that they need, sending them to Quest if that's what they need. Um, frankly, encouraging them to talk with their coach or talk with their teacher, their instructor. Right. That, um, you know, we instructors want them to succeed. And so we don't know until those students come and talk with us. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was a good opportunity for one person in particular to reach out to their instructor and realize the instructors are on their side and that we re realize all kinds of other things are going on in their lives. You know? 
You know, the other, you know, thing that's been infused in this, in this class is the summer reading. Yeah. And we've made reference a little bit to Fallen Mountains by one of our own faculty members, uh, Kimmy Cunningham Grant. Uh, and it is a fictional tale, it takes place in a small town in Pennsylvania, much like our own Huntingdon, maybe yeah. even a little smaller. Um, and it's sort of framed as a mystery, although I would push back a little bit on it being a mystery. Yeah. Uh, but it's certainly about relationships and silence and being known and you know, being invisible, and uh, and there's so much there to unpack. We had students reflect on it, and uh, and and you know, I was just overwhelmed by the level of engagement yeah. that students show. Because I'm used to you know summer readings where you know about a third of the students don't really pick up the book, <laughs> and about a third of the students skim it, and you know a third are pretty dutiful. I felt like most of my students knew the book pretty well. Yeah. And, uh, and through this kind of um, contest challenge, you know, some really went above and beyond to provide content that was tremendous. I had one student who composed uh, a musical number oh, that traced so cool. a jur the journey of one of the main characters and performed it on the marimba. I mean, it was what? just like, I know. like Scored the book. That's I know, awesome. right? It's a, it's, a, awesome. it's a YouTube that he shared. And uh, he was kind of humble and embarrassed in the in the moment when, you know, we, we said, wow, this, this is tremendous among a set of tremendous yeah. moments. Yeah, and, talent. <laughs> and talent to and spare. Passion, but, right? uh, you know, I had another student who did a fictional piece that extended the story and oh. investigated, you know, a piece that had been, um, had been left kind of uh, unexplored. And, and students really, I think, took this opportunity to engage with each other and with this text to make meaning together about uh, about the book and themselves. Yeah, and the beauty of that read, so I think it's a fantastic book. It was a really, it was a real pleasure to read through. Um, and I too was really surprised by how many people honestly read the book, right? Uh, and some of the beauty of having that summer read is when we talk about roommate issues or we talk about, um, uh, I don't know, uh, questions about how you interact with your family or you ask about questions about relationships, interpersonal relationships. Um, you can use the characters in the book to introduce kind of that, some of that conflict and how people handled it well or handled it in this case, not so well, yeah, most, most yeah. often. <laughs> uh, and so we can explore that uh, instead of asking individuals to single out their own experiences. And I think in that some of those cases, some students volunteer a, a situation that they've, a similar situation they've been in. And other times, um, I think they just are happy to recognize that other people can identify with that and I'm not the only one. Uh, who has a trouble? Who has trouble speaking up, right? Mm -hmm. Or feel that I've been in a position that I've had very little control over, or something like that, right? So, um, and yeah, I've had fantastic um, submissions in in my section, and you know, we worked closely with our director of writing, Professor Belwar, uh, and so she helped us craft what the competition would look like. Uh, and one of the, the greatest things of that was that we had four different topics that folks could write about and four different media that yeah. they could use. And so um, I think it's really important for us to recognize that, you know, the more we structure our classrooms, the same type of thing, it's really a game. And either you know how to play that game or you don't. And I think that's unfair to students. I mm -hmm. think students have so many strengths and other capacities that we don't often hear about. And I think this is one opportunity to say, this is a student who really shines with this type of format, yeah. right? Right. Uh, and, and maybe that person does super well also in a chemistry lab, I don't know. Um, but it's a very different type of asking a student to give some sort of feedback, yeah. right? And, and to play to their strengths, their interests, frankly. Yeah. Well, to that end, there are other texts. And by texts, I mean, moments on campus where we have the opportunity to engage broadly around speakers, you know, around, you know, lectures, around events, and, uh, and we encourage students to take part in those things. <coughs> and to that end, I think when they do, that, you know, their moment on campus is truly enriched because they can apply what they're learning in the classroom, 
they can ask maybe some questions that have come up in other places and make connections across the curriculum. And, and this place is known for interdisciplinarity of that type. Can you talk right. a little bit about the intellectual environment that maybe you've experienced or you've helped foster and why that's an important part of the liberal arts? Yeah, sure. You want to start off? Um, I would say there's like, <coughs> there's always an opportunity for um, just outside of the classroom, but furthering your education because there's a, a, a math, another math um, seminar, I believe, or get just an open house or something happening um, Saturday morning at ten thirty. Mm. Um, oh, it's the math, math and physics department open house, mm. and it's inviting um, all the students and the parents that will be coming for homecoming just to, um, you know, just hang out and talk about whatever whatever it is that they want to talk about. Sounds great. That's um, awesome. They, um, Professor Unger, my chemistry teacher, is always um, talking about the events that the chemistry department are housing. Um, there, were, there was like coffee and donuts the other day. And um, it's just, it's time to, to get out and relax amongst your peers and as well with faculty and just, you know, to calm down outside the classroom. And even though you're not talking about um, in-class topics, you could be talking about anything chemistry or anything math related at the yeah. time. Yeah, um, so Professor Unger and I are, are close friends in the same department, and um, I don't want to spill, maybe I shouldn't spill the beans, but it's too late now. Cat's out of the bag now. But he's working on <laughs> an heard idea. Of your first. That's right. Uh, he's working on an idea with Professor Dickey in the English department to do a Sherlock Holmes interdisciplinary course where they talk about the literature of detective novels, but that's coupled with the chemistry Ooh. and kind of the using the forensic kind of analytical thought to arrive at the, the to, to to solve right the, the, the question of food limit so um yeah so there are these really fun type of interactions so i'm a member of a community called lc the uh, ethical legal and societal implications of scientific research and so through that community i interacted with faculty who were in uh history philosophy uh in uh, biology, chemistry, um, uh, international studies. And uh, that's been so enriching because it's mm. challenged me in new ways and to think about the other things my students really want and need, right? And so through that interaction, I ended up filling in for Dr. Keeney while she was on sabbatical in a class called um, Genomics, Ethics, and Society, where Dr. Bell Tootin and I were co-teaching that class to uh, where we used um, scientific literature to look at uh, kind of, uh, for example, um, what it means to pin a, a, to, uh, to pin a gene on alcoholism and whether to oh. rob people of agency of that, what that means for uh, free will, right? And, and putting blame on crimes, things like that. We talked about kind of the ethics of that. We, we had this, the class read um, The Immortal Life of Henry of the Lacks, oh, of course. And so, so good. we talked about research <laughs> ethics on that one. Um, we talked about the Tuskegee experiments. We talked about um, reproductive rights. We talked about um, uh, eugenics uh, and the birth of that. Uh, and and it's a great mix of half biology, chemistry, genetics students, and half who are interested in philosophy and, and sociology and anthropology. Uh, and so that was a fun class. And then Dr. Roney, who's in um, international studies in the Russian uh, art. Dr. Dr. Awesome. You love Dr. Roney? He's a fantastic guy. I, I, I had ideas and ideas and uh, powers of modern yeah. of modern history last mm, semester. Yeah. It was a good time. Uh, he, he, he blows my mind. I could listen to him talk mm -hmm. for <laughs> days. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And so we have a lot of fun. He and I first taught a class that was called From Lab to World. It was a pilot class thinking about what freshman year might be like. And, uh, and so we, um, in that class, we kind of explored what uh, we, the scientists often think about our research ends at the bench, and we don't think about how that kind of pushes beyond that into society. And so in that class, we kind of pulled on that and asked, you know, what other things do you have to worry about when you're a scientist, like writing grants and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, public's uh, perception of the science you do, and then vice versa. If you are a citizen, you also need to be educated on the science and have faith in the scientific structures and institutions that we use. And 
why your tax dollars go to the National Institutes of Health and things like that. It's much more than so, a chemist is going. <laughs> but that's the, I mean, that's what the, my hands? That's the liberally educated person, right? The person who's able to make the connection between the practice and the experience, the governance, and, you know, the implications of it. I mean, that is the person that we're training our Juniadians to be. And so it's so important that people have these moments of connectedness yeah. and these experiences on campus that beg us to think about philosophy through the eyes of a chemist yeah. or international relations from the perspective of genomics. Yeah. Um, that That is the power of what's happening in this place and space. Yeah, and well, I, I guess we exciting. can use that as a segue to the third element. You were asking about the first year um, uh, classes. The third element in the spring semester, students will take a second semester of this foundations course where we then ask them to think beyond themselves to think about put themselves in their community uh, their local community to the global community, but then students will also take a first year seminar class. And so these are classes that faculty come up with of things that interest them. And so Professor Roney and I piloted one last year. He's going to run this spring called Water Wars, where we talked about um, water as a scarcity and how that mm. leads to geopolitical conflict, uh, where our water comes from, frankly, and kind of respecting water rights. So for example, um, uh, I forget, was it? Columbus, who granted human rights to uh, Lake Erie. Did you hear about this? No. And so what they, they gave personhood <laughs> to Lake contentious. Erie. And so we need to then uh, respect Lake Erie as if it were a person. So we can oh, dump wow. disgusting things into it. So it, we ran into some really fascinating things. Yeah. And talking about the Flint water crisis, of course, and just exactly how many schools still have lead pipes and and just those really fascinating things, challenges well, that corporations students are have can to be people, with. why not lakes? That's right? exactly the philosophy. That's right. what the, the community used. So yeah. Well, that sounds great. And 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 like the writing course, they will be focused on you know a disciplinary point of view, that's and right. each one will be different. That's so right. students will be able to connect into them in a powerful way. Yeah. Well, I'm mindful that we're over time, right? Oh, the conversation yeah, just like, by. whoosh. Um, but, uh, you know, what I do want to do is explore, you know, some of what students will learn in the second year and the third year and the fourth year. That curriculum doesn't just end with that onboarding in the, in the first year uh, element. And so uh, if you'll come back, we'll have you back. I'd be sort of delighted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but, thank um, you. For those of you who uh, found this uh, appealing and exciting, and I hope that's everyone, we'll invite you back next week uh, where we uh, will be talking a little bit more. Uh, encourage you to sign up for the Facebook group uh, if you are able, and uh, we'll post uh, more information and have some conversation there. If you see uh, Davion or I over Homecoming and Family Weekend, please uh, stop us and say hi, and uh, certainly ask any questions or engage us in some conversation. It looks to be a beautiful weekend, a little rainy on Saturday, it's a good uh, uh, but beautiful 80s uh, here in Huntington. And, uh, and, it, and so if you're traveling, safe travels. Uh, it'll be exciting to welcome you here um, to our, uh, our campus. I'm not nearly as green as I look. <laughs> not nearly, as you probably can tell. Not nearly as mean. I'm not nearly as mean either, as you might have heard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. We'll see you next week. Thanks, guys.